то, что сейчас происходит, what's happening now is just as disastrous and irreversible as what happened in Russia in 1917. I couldn't even imagine that the state could break all the boundaries paying such disrespect to people, to the enemies, to emit so much evil, so much malice from the national TV. Not just propaganda, but real evil. I have never seen anything like that. Never. And you have no right to stop development in this country. You have no right to put a noose around young people's neck. You just don't have this right. We've lost a lot as a civilization of the old world. I'm talking about the Christian civilization. We lost a lot for those 70, 80 years. We've been living apart, cut off by the Iron Curtain, and we couldn't even see each other. And many of us in Europe and in the Soviet Union, and maybe some of us, managed to kind of look through the Iron Curtain, could hear each other, could talk to each other. But it wasn't enough. It turned out to be not enough. So therefore, we can't quite develop some very subtle and very important elements of democratic society. We understand that a party principle of building political system uh, is exhausted itself, has exhausted itself, and what it was in 19th century and in 20th century, and all the principles of building parliamentary structure, principles of building government and organizing educational system and all that. So all that uh, used to be built uh, with the party principle in it. But in fact, nobody is thinking about anything else. If you ask in Russia or you ask people in Western Europe, would they have prepared all those big brains in terms of sociology and all that, how, how they are going to develop the society, how they're going, what are the principles of development of uh, the state based on Christian principles, they can't really offer you anything new. I asked this question a million times to uh, our presidents and our politicians and our social activists. So how shall we build government in Russia? And Russia is uh, old, is old regime, is infected with all these sins and vices, all this early uh, Romanov's period and the Soviet uh, time and this infection uh, uh, was transmitted from one generation to another and uh, everything is infected, uh, the state and people alike. And it's I'm not even talking about the population, I'm talking about the people of uh, the country. And here we have quite a serious challenge. That's why those politicians, they can't quite agree on anything and they won't. In my view, we are in, in such circumstances uh, when many principles, they exhausted themselves. 
but to actually admit it. I'm talking about those who are building the government, uh, those who are uh, building the law enforcement systems. So they need to start thinking about it, but they don't want to. None of the governments in the world wants to actually seriously think about evolution, evolution of the state. And so-called law enforcement uh, bodies, they don't want it particularly. Uh, they deteriorate in such a way that they're not uh, law enforcement agencies anymore. They're more uh, law oppressing agencies. And I spoke to uh, politicians and we talked about uh, how Russia should be built and so how to deal with those institutions that don't work anymore. But it's really, I'm like alone in the desert, shouting. But for me, it's clear that we cannot live within these parameters anymore. It's impossible. And I think that what's happening now, this is just as disastrous and irreversible as what happened to Russia in 1917. Back then, we split the world and we did the same now, something that is incomprehensible, something that couldn't be even termed properly. We did something how to really put it? It's really, it's really awful when you can't uh, make a step back. To make a couple of steps back and, you know, think and say to yourself, oh my God, we made such a mistake and kind of forgive me, forgive us. It was such a mistake, so we'll go the other way, so it's, uh, we, done, we should have done that. But what's happening now is irreversible. It is just as radical as dividing the world into two uneven, not really two parts, because the communist regime in the Soviet Russia wasn't spread across the world to the largest part of the world, but they actually hit culture the hardest, the culture of the world world. If, if, you, if you want, it, they hit Christian tradition, and that hit was very, very hard. I do ex foresee what we may expect in two months. I, I wouldn't say it because uh, something that you said may come true, but things that were unsaid may not come true. But so far, we are moving in the same pace as we used to move when we had that revolutionary revolt in 1917. Now we can't really turn off what's happening right in front of our eyes. It seems to us this is just a war, or as they call it, you know, a military operation. It's neither. In some sense, we are getting to the ground zero. And it's bad for all of us. But if we touch on aristocracy, you know, aristocracy is too modest and too delicate. Military aristocracy, they could do something if we had it. But since in the Russian army, they never really had the military aristocracy. Maybe it would form itself uh, during the, if we didn't have the First World War and we didn't have that absurdity. Among the officers of the 
middle rank officers, uh, the junior officers, not generals. So in that middle part of the military, so they had the idea of honor, decency, and in our literature, we could see uh, how it was reflected. So military aristocracy could change something, could impact something. But what about the Soviet army? Don't you think that the, they actually had a class of military aristocracy? I think that after the end of the Second World War, not the Great Patriotic War, I'm talking about the Second World War. So yes, in some highest sense, we had that aristocracy. And somehow that military aristocracy was somehow supported, strangely enough, by the Communist Party. And uh, there were certain institutions uh, that were kind of supporting uh, positions of uh, individuals. Uh, there were some, you know, they had meetings and events uh, where they would uh, reward good deeds. And in some way, it was it was a game and no game at the same time. You, I would say the, the goals were clearer and the relationships were clearer. And at least was understanding that in the military environment. Mm. This uh, money issue it, uh, didn't play a big role. Now money is a category of highest degree, both for uh, for the rookies and uh, uh, for those girls that want to marry uh, officers and for girls it's a great motivation especially those who want to form a military family so not really the relationship but uh, the money that can they can get uh, marrying a military officer so in this monetization of motives of life of principles of life they work destructively and against Russian character, let's put it this way, and against the nature of living in the country that is spread across such a vast territory. We are very different in this country. In all cities of Russia, we are very different. Remember when we went to Voronezh city and I was there for the first time and I actually noticed completely different people in Arkhangelsk, in, in the north. I always speak about it, you know, uh, those northern regions of Russia or say Irkutsk in Siberia, near Baikal. It's just amazing people, completely different people. Yes, completely different. They should be united around some noble, very, very pure idea, not something that was made up, but the idea that really exists in order to be a country, right? Both the country and the people, Russian people. So what kind of idea that could be? Honor. Honor in everything. Honor in uh, political conduct. Honor in quality of work. In raising children. In honor in respect to the elderly. Remember Solzhenitsyn. He spoke about those principles and wrote about them a lot. And remember how quickly uh, he wasn't needed anymore uh, because he was speaking about such simple principles, uh, basic principles, and it kind of made him silent. Uh, these words of his when he said how to how to build Russia. So what do you think Solzhenitsyn uh, tell you uh, on 24th of February? 
you know, here I don't know. I don't know. He was that kind of person that could look very deeply into, uh, into a person, and he had quite a broad vision on the events. And I wouldn't think that he would be narrowed in thinking about the situation. And I, I don't think he would take either part in this conflict. But after talking to him, uh, I know that uh, he had a lot of concerns about this southern Slavic peoples, the Stavropol region, the Krasnodar region, Ukraine. He was very much concerned about those people and how things are going there and in the context of culture as well this kind of mixed uh, view and this mixed conduct of uh, them I don't even know how to put it uh, some sort of uh, mixed breed, I don't know, I can't find the proper words actually to put that, but you know, kind of mixed breed and everything, and that's why all Slavs are suffering so much, both in Balkans uh, and in Ukraine, and we, because we're not sort of pure in a sense, you know, there's a lot of garbage in us. Oftentimes, uh, we are uh, very uh, unfair and unreliable as friends. But we have to be very careful because, you know, behind us we have the northern ocean. In other words, nothing. Right? And those horrifying words when they said, you know, the country has only two allies, Navy and the Army. So this is really a dead-end ideology. And we know that if the Army is failing, so the state is failing, then what we have? Culture only. Culture is everywhere, both in in, uh, in the trenches and in the bomb shelter, will never leave the person if the person has elementary traits of a civilized individual. And I think women, they will be committed to culture to their very last breath. I think even intuitively, they will be protecting culture, both from men, from the state, from the stupid politicians, from stupidity and the dullness, absolutely infinite dullness. What we're concerned now, and what we're talking about now, there is nothing new. What we have in the agenda, this is uh, life and existence of uh, our society, Russian society, and actually there is nothing new in this. All those old questions that were washed with tears and blood, and we didn't answer those questions, or we were not ready to answer those questions, and now we're paying the price for not understanding what happened during the Stalin's time in 1930s and 40s. As people, we didn't understand anything. We didn't understand what it was. And the church, Orthodox Church, didn't understand what happened. It, it kind of forgave all those exterminations of monks, those who had pure souls. They were slaughtered like animals, and they were killed, shot, and they were rotting in uh, concentration camps in Russia. This is what I think, you know, if at some point, you know, all truths will come to the surface and we will know everything that happened in our country in the 20th century. 
relationship uh, of people from the point of view of great repressions because we still don't know what actually going on and just imagine uh, this dehumanization that happened in the 20th century can person admit that they can do something like that now long ago in this uh, underground publishing that we had and we had the uh, Gulag archipelago Gulag and we when we read it and I have to say that all those things are termed and his book the red wheel is already written and you know all that is spelled out this protective reaction uh, of many people is understandable because this uh, radical analytical work cannot be uh, undertaken uh, by all people what's, what's important those who are at the helm they need to understand it and step by step they need to spell it out for other people i mean teachers in schools uh, people from culture people who work in law enforcement in fact now these are repression bodies all of them should be united around the idea we either do the transformation together or we just stop existing as russia as a state and that's what it's going to be and there is nothing supernatural here and i and i think uh, uh, other people will go through this and uh, they'll go through this destruction of the state and right like today you know millions of people they're supporting uh, this war uh, this military operation and I remember when uh, the TV rain was still around and they had this uh, on air when there was the first decision uh, of uh, the Federal Council and uh, when they uh, passing the law and given uh, the mandate to the president uh, that uh, Russian military force could be used outside of Russia and there were many people who were supporting this I was looking at these people at that rally who were supporting there are lots of women there and I was thinking that so you're not feeling pity uh, for your for your children for your grandfather's fathers and the children that are not born so strange women but I think, you know, people, they're able to adapt to anything. But the country that is torn into small regions, small parts that are deprived of uh, agricultural population, farmers, uh, they can adapt to anything but uh, uh, radiation contamination. Alexander Nikolaevich, uh, to what you said, uh, that the thought that is uttered uh, with the highest degree could be materialized, uh, and it happened to you in 2008. It was actually 2007. Okay, 2007. Yeah. Wrongly dated video. Okay. So everything you said. At that interview, everything came true. 2007. We are going to have a very hard war with Ukraine and a very difficult conflict with Kazakhstan. Here I'm not talking about the expansion of China. Uh, this is uh, extremely serious challenge. But you see here, you don't have to be extra smart in order to understand it. But see, people didn't. Just explain it to me, please, point by point. I even wrote it down for myself. In 2007, you were saying that there will be an extremely difficult war with Ukraine and it's inevitable. What was it in 2007 that made you think like that? 
и растущего национального национального противостояния. It was a много очень политических сигналов, которые которые national tensions between the countries. There were lots of political signals that were actually telling us that. And before that, I went to Krivoy Rog city and to Kiev, and then I studied in, in the college with my peers from Ukraine, and I could see that these are two different peoples, two different natures, two different cultures, actually two different temperaments, two different worlds of motivation. And it told me that it couldn't go like that no longer. And back then, for me, it was very obvious this uh, ethnic tension between the two nations. And as now, you know, the president doesn't want to talk about this national issues and all of a sudden I kind of break through it and I begin to talk about it. Here I'm talking about Caucasus and the problem in Caucasus. And for us, it's in the future, it's going to be a huge national problem that is ethnically motivated. In the and this conflict could be avoided, and back then it could be avoided. And even now certain things could be avoided. For example, Chechen troops could be withdrawn from Ukraine, so to stop uh, invading the region, to stop all these military forces, to do the complete demilitarization of the region. So far, it's possible. So far, it's possible. In other words, to go back to constitutional norms. But they don't do it. They simply don't do it. They don't do things that should be done according to the laws of Russian Federation. It's like must be done. And the Constitutional Court should be very active and uh, very concerned about this. And of course, the Constitutional Court does nothing. And all those things are the signs of political degradation. And I could tell it in 2007. And of course, early, I'm talking about the political degradation. And political degradation uh, in this case, this this is a degradation of professionalism in all political institutions. While the key objective of life should be culture and it should penetrate all parts of life, then we can uh, deal with the decline. But while we have the goals uh, as uh, just making money and uh, pumping oil, nothing good ahead of us. I spoke on different levels about it. When we talk about Crimea, many military officers, uh, professionally, they took this operation in Crimea as, as a great military operation that was done so peacefully. On, on the one hand, we understand that Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and our Minister of Foreign Affairs doesn't do much in order to draw uh, social attention to this uh, and to create some sort of softening atmosphere so, so that oh, everybody could see what's happening there. Maybe the whole thing wouldn't be as bad as it was done on the side of Russia. So this unprofessionalism of these institutions actually brought us where we are. So when, when we have this irreversible accusations. And I think, in my view, actually, this is unprofessionalism. When I go abroad and I see our ambassadors and diplomats 
who are working out embassies. And sadly, I have to say, uh, what a deplorable picture this is. Myself, as a citizen, I don't really have much in common with the position of uh, um, ambassadors of my country. I have humanitarian and political disagreement with the political uh, leadership of my country. I was never thinking in going uh, in politics uh, because I know it's a professional work, serious work. But even for me, uh, who works with students and does filmmaking, uh, even for me it's clear that it's full of mistakes, full of decisions, uh, of ir irritable decisions. The decisions, they don't take into account our life. And there are lots of such decisions. I'm here. Uh, taking medications after the operation, uh, heart operation that I had. And I'm not going to tell you how much those medications cost. But you know, somehow I work, somehow I make money, and I sometimes can buy these medications. But millions of my peers can't go to the pharmacy anymore and get those medications. And for me, after the heart surgery and after the operation I had uh, on my legs, you know, in me I have uh, Swiss and German uh, equipment. And uh, it's all from abroad. I think we have very expensive foreign policy. Because, of course, we have internal policy, domestic policy that is very expensive and it's mutilating for all of us. Clearly, that Caucasus, uh, that 90% of uh, those people, they vote uh, for the leading party in the country and they will support this party always but we simply cannot stand it cannot endure it we'll we'll lose a lot and it's very difficult to admit uh, when we lose our trust to the government and I'm the person that who, who needs the state and we, of course a strong and honest and fair state fair state this is what I'm talking about yeah. 2007 I don't see that Caucasus problem is being resolved. It's it's going to exacerbate, and we can see there is a growing crisis there with the Russian national nationals. They they have completely new mindset, and this mindset is not understood by the Russian government. They don't understand that our army and the Tsar even back then. And the army that was uh, blessed by Russian uh, priests to go there and to kill people in, Oca in Caucasus. And their ethnicities, uh, there are 300, 400,000 people were killed of those ethnicities. This is a huge price. To forget about it, to cross it out, it's just impossible for those ethnicities. You said uh, that the decisions that are needed today are not made. You've known President Putin for quite a while. And your relationship with him, uh, uh, we could see, and some of your talks were public, and we saw that. So today, what do you feel towards this man? 
you see, um, it may sound strange, but I have a very deep feeling for his destiny. I couldn't even imagine what might this person feel when they realize that they can make mistakes. He is a very committed person, committed to his principles, to his uh, beliefs, his motives. Despite my many years disagreement with him, I'm still surprised why certain things didn't happen that could happen. And I know he's stopped some people who wanted to kind of put a stop to my work and activity, arrest me or whatever, I don't know. But having the experience of uh, uh, working with Boris Yeltsin, we have very good relationship with him, very human relationship and very close relationship with the first president. I'm just thinking how to put it more precisely. At some point, Boris Yeltsin agreed with me that historical situation is going ahead of him. And I told him several times, there is no such a state leader that could run faster than the history runs. And there is no any proper improvisation that could work for this extreme pace of history. And at that point, when he felt that he is lagging behind quite significantly, then in 1991, excuse me, 1999, he uh, decided to resign and he addressed the people. And his motive was not his physical state because he was a very strong person and, uh, and he could do what he was supposed to do till the very end. But he just realized that he's lagging behind. Does today's president have this understanding that he is lagging behind, behind the historical run? No matter how fast you run along the river, you will never run faster than the stream of the river. And you can't even hope for that. The river will flow into the ocean and where it is and where it is, what it is, you won't be able to identify. Vote for those for whom humanitarian principles are higher than political ones. And I was always convinced that this is how you need to build political work of opposition parties. And I was always giving them this motto. And none of these opposition parties, uh, they accepted uh, this motto. So when you go far from humanitarian principles, humanitarian structure always leads you to a disaster. Because 90 out of 100 cases, you, you cannot find a political way out from the situation. Only to the going to the humanitarian principles area, on that basis, you can stop what's happening, say, there in Ukraine. Only on the humanitarian principles 
basis. But nobody even thinks about it. Uh, politicians, they don't have this tool. They don't even, they're not even aware of this tool. But it's not scalpel. They're used to working with scalpel. And it's not. So we need to take away scalpel from them. Surgery should stop being the main method to resolve conflicts in people's relations. Of course, I can be mistaken because my analytical uh, instrument is very human and in, in some ways I'm very conservative. And in some ways I'm uh, maybe extra radical. I am not cautious. People used to rebuke me and uh, those people who actually like me and they used to tell me that I don't uh, conduct properly with the authority, that I'm very harsh and uh, I speak too much. And yes, true, yes, I do. In the social life, you know, I am not a professional person, you know, even in directing, I make mistakes and quite significant ones, so let alone social life. That's quite a tough path in life, uh, because, you know, nature gave me this social temperament and, and uh, I do feel sorry that, you know, since my school years that I was very much interested in history, not philology. And actually that gives you an answer why I behave the way I behave with this particular temperament, social temperament. Of course, I suffer from this as a director. It doesn't add anything to improving my life or, uh, it always makes uh, those life circumstances more complicated but this is the given and I'm not the only one who has it when I look at my young colleagues and citizens I could tell that uh, most of them have this great sacrificing social temperament and very smart one. It's not like something that I was given it by nature and I, at some time I was walking through a fog, I was living in very bad conditions and isolated conditions in some outskirts of the Soviet Empire. And I didn't understand many things, and in many ways I was blind, but people who go there, who young people, uh, they have good education, uh, they have pure blood, so to speak. And for them, Russia is not just empty name. No, it's not. No, it's not. Alexander, may I go back to this uh, interview of yours in 2007? And you also sa said there could be a quite difficult conflict with Kazakhstan. Do you still have that feeling? Yes, I do. Because uh, national issues are not tackled, they are not resolved. And there are some other things that I would want to say that because it could be very very wrong about it but yes there can be quite difficult situation and that front will be impossible to cover if here in ukraine they have forces but there in kazakhstan 
this scale will be absolutely different and uh, uh, the forces that could come there would be absolutely uh, insurmountable for my country. And you see, we're quite inadequate in our ambitions. You know, if, Ameri if the Americans, they say about the ambitions, uh, planetary ambitions, so what they do, they develop their industry, uh, uh, they help talents to express themselves, uh, they do scientific researches, you know, they expand uh, the education and, and many other things. Quite large projects. So they develop their culture and they develop their cinematography. And it made it a planetary cinematography. At some point, I told our president that first it's me who is coming to a country, and then maybe you will, or maybe not. But I come to those countries with a completely different purpose. I, first of all, I come uh, and I'm, I'm not, I don't rush there, I don't invade them. And first, before I come, I uh, ask them, may I come? And Americans, they manage to, uh, with their political gift, uh, with their entrepreneurial sense and with many other different things, they managed to realize that this is a completely different uh, power, uh, the power of mass culture can help to resolve many issues. And places where uh, an American soldier could come, uh, it's not necessarily that the American soldier will be met there as a foreigner. Because this archetype, uh, this motivation uh, of behavior, this dynamics, fashion, character, whatever, so people already saw it in movies and many other things, and people kind of accept it. But for this, you uh, should live without censorship in the film, uh, you, freedom must be there, exchange of ideas should be free, and many other things. If we could have this opportunity to present ourselves as a wholehearted people, uh, sensible people and uh, uh, hard-working people sometimes, but the bureaucracy in Russia and political system in Russia completely excludes development. And that makes me very sad as our Ministry of Culture completely excludes development of uh, cinematography. Uh, using money, yes, but development, no. And you see, as a result, we are in a conflict zone from all sides. We understand uh, that a relationship with Europe couldn't be improved, uh, that uh, NATO will be moving forward, and the uh, reaction uh, to those actions will be, which it will be. And plus, all those issues that we have in the south of Russia and in the east of Russia, and of course, it, it puts uh, the country in great danger, our state and our life. And also in that interview, you say, back then, in 2007, you spoke about uh, the inevitability of uh, disagreements with Europe. And right now, before the war, and back then, uh, the Russian president kept saying that uh, Russia and Europe, uh, uh, they go different ways. Why he has this uh, dislike to Europe? I myself, uh, uh, working in culture, I cannot live without Europe, you know. For me, Europe is like my elder sister. It taught me a lot. It uh, educated me in many ways. And some other things, myself being kind of more mature, I can bring to Europe and show to Europe. And I can see certain things maybe better than they see there. But in Europe, 
in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, I have part of my heart there, you know, yes. it's... I work with great pleasure with people of different nationalities, with different actors. My colleagues, filmmakers in different countries, in different languages, but, you know, we can overcome that. European culture has roots of our civilization, in, in Russia's as well. Roots, not the branches and the tops, but the roots. And my roots are there too. I can work outside of Russia, and I do. But my motherland is where Russian language is. I can work outside of Russia, but it's very difficult to live. And I think that, roughly speaking, I can be a Russian Orthodox on the Northern Pole, but I can be Russian only here in Russia, because Russia is only here, where the Russian language is. But you know, all these noble thoughts, noble feelings, and the real ones, such people like me, maybe, you know, what, what saves us, uh, because we're old, when, when I look at my physical state, and, you know, it's kind of disappearing in a sense, you know, and uh, so what I foresee, I might not see uh, in reality, and it makes me sad in a sense, uh, and, and, and in some way it actually eases my state, and I am sad because how little I can actually change being here. In many ways we are like psychics in Russia. You know, Tolstoy uh, wrote War and Peace. When else, you know, you could write such, such a work? You know, the whole thing is in one thick book. There is no such a novel in Europe. Couldn't be, and couldn't be written. There. But the Europeans, they wrote all quiet at the Western Front, you know, very different. May I ask you this? So what do you expect? in the short term, when all the mass media is closed. Two years ago, I actually formulated it in my letter to Putin uh, when TV Rain channel uh, was uh, shut down, and now it's turned down completely. So uh, without going into the political context, I am not evaluating the professional level and all this. For me, what's important is that a young group of people, a young company was stopped. No development. You stop the development, you can, you know, fight at those political arenas and all that, but you have no right to stop development in this country, and you have no right to put a noose on young people's neck. You have no right. So what this crime does, it will significantly, uh, significantly impede the development of young people, and it will make them miserable, very unfortunate. So they will be very unfortunate. And many organizations like that that were shut down, and uh, many of them I didn't like, many of them didn't like me, but it doesn't really matter. You cannot rape young people. 
you can you cannot make children like that you know no children will be born from this you just cannot do that and you cannot stop development this is professional and say uh, political uh, misconception when you do that so because it does not improve life the mechanism of life it worsens it more and more and more this is what threatens us uh, there will be more and more unfortunate people because somebody uh, accuses somebody and some people go to internet to me internet seems to be uh, kind of a gray zone and you know people are hiding but you know people should be outside should be hiding the harder it is for the country the more we should be outside we shouldn't be like diving into the holes and hiding we should be all outside here right under the sun should be seen so this is how it threatens us this is the consequences of this and three more questions I uh, actually formulated them uh, uh, long ago and it actually it wasn't me who formulated those questions how do you answer the question Russia without freedom or freedom without Russia you know this too I don't think there is or between these two uh, first of all in Russia they don't know the taste of freedom but there was a very short time when I didn't really look into uh, the uh, state organism and you know uh, Yeltsin the first president he didn't actually manage to kind of build on this it was this new period you know and there was the time uh, when the mass media couldn't quite figure out what was the Chechen war they couldn't see what it was why it is and why it is who and for what and all that so they didn't see what was the war and as soon as uh, the construct of the Russian state started building itself the first thing that it did it started controlling this bird of freedom first they tied its paws and they they put it in the cage so this is the first that they did in 2000 look at uh, the beginning of the transformation in the society when the Bolsheviks came in power they did some incredible things they liquidated illiteracy and they separated the church from the government and electrification so these three things uh, they determined uh, the life of that revolution and then it turned out that it should be done faster and how to do it so only by forcing by oppressing not discussion first they started doing it kind of softly but then full swing without even thinking you know and, and all those uh, famous documents that you know Bolsheviks has already signed should those who think differently so that, that's why I think in people's mind they don't have this understanding of freedom it simply doesn't exist there maybe there is a reason for that or maybe the reason is simple at some point Putin said if there is a crisis in the country
and there will be hesitation in what, what tools to choose to tackle it. And he said, I assure you that the people of the country, they will say this already, that all your democracy, we don't need that. It's inappropriate. Back then, uh, it, it was kind of blotted out, and I remember that very well. And, and I said to Boris Yeltsin uh, about it, and I said, everything will go back to what it was. And, and he was uh, very hurt by that. And at some point, he was so hurt that we haven't talked for two weeks. And I, was, I kept saying it to him, you know, everything will get back. Everything will go to the reverse. And uh, he couldn't believe. But somehow in my head, I saw that. Maybe that's why people are so afraid of us, because uh, we did not quite experience that. We don't know what it is. We didn't feel it. We didn't understand freedom. And probably because the sacrifice that the country paid is absolutely unmeasurable. When I look at the materials uh, that show us what uh, young researchers do when, when they find bones of the Second World War, and oftentimes I think, you know, how many people in the country completely forgot about their sons and fathers who died in that war? All those uh, mothers, daughters, granddaughters, where are all those bones? Millions of people didn't even look for those bones. They didn't even start doing this. And now, you know, there are these groups of searches that do that, you know, some relatives of those who were who dead in the war, who died in the war, they come and they look at those bones and, uh, and bury them and, and all that. But frankly, so many years passed since the war, decades, right? A lot, many decades, and nobody was looking for those bones in cities, in villages, both intelligent people and very simple people, they didn't even have a thought to look for those from their families. Maybe some people were writing letters, were trying to find those people, but in general, if we're talking about like 10,000 people or maybe like a regiment or a division, but it's not a division or a regiment, it's a millions of people completely forgotten, dead and forgotten. That's why we as a country were terra incognita for uh, most of the world. On the one hand, there was the Stalin system and uh, enormous sacrifice during the war. And on the other hand, the oblivion of all those who died in the war. And another facet to it, despite all of this, the most favorable banner is a red banner that is soaked with blood. This is their most precious banner. But we need to go on. Those who are supposed to go on, who were destined to live, who have this privilege to live. We need to live, we need to do everything uh, that we are called for, everything that you have physical talent for and spiritual talent and do what you do the best, teach yourself, teach yourself, do it better, teach yourself, learn, it's hard, but yet it's our purpose. If to ask, if you answer the question what to do, work, work, sometimes clenching your teeth, clenching your teeth and do it in the proper way and enjoy what you do and love what you do.
In my view, there is no any other way for those who live. And with all those debts that we have up there, it will be figured out and we will be punished for what we do in our life. Here on earth and all our parents all those parents who can nobly take the death of their children those higher properties will talk to them how do you answer the question what is more uh, important motherland or truth of course truth because if I am committed to the truth if I follow the truth and I follow it then the motherland will be backing me up and will be protected and will be capable will be honest beautiful if I answer the question uh, person or state of course person of course person of course person is primary but also, you know, the, the line is very complex because, you know, this moral issue for the French when they can answer the question, okay, probably they can answer the question, but they don't. What to do with the situation of uh, French collaboration, collaborationist state of Vichy? Was, what, was it good or not? So what to do with that? Of course, it, it was to save millions of lives and save French culture. And of course, for France, for this unique people and for this unique cultural oasis, uh, civilization is a good thing. But on the other uh, scale, there is Russia, and there they were fighting for everything during that war. They were fighting for every little creek, for every little village, while others could save themselves in this collaborationist state. Frankly, I wouldn't want to be a fr French. I wouldn't. And, you know, let alone what was uh, uh, happening in uh, Paris uh, when French were giving away Jewish families with all their guts and stuff, uh, with, with all the furniture, with, all, with everything that those Jewish families had. They were giving away them to the Nazis. We need to learn how to tackle systematic issues outside of the political context. Building a state outside of the political context, they'll tell me that this is impossible. I, I will say that this is possible and it's not only it must be done this way, outside of political context. I won't say what it requires, the step by step, and I won't say it here, just not to endanger you and, and your channel. But if I understand it, then I'm sure that there are smarter people who understand it better than I do. And we? We need to work. That's what I think. We need to work we need to work thank you
Спасибо. Thank you. Thank you. Are you tired? Let's smoke. A bit later. It's very difficult to speak because the price of the word is very high and as at the same time is very insignificant too. <laughs> Let's smoke, you know. All right. As they would say it in Ukraine, so the cigarettes are from abroad. You know, when planes were still flying, I always buy cigarettes in the airport. In Pulkovo in St. Petersburg. Good cigarettes. Actually, Russian cigarettes are pretty good. So at, we can do something at least, you know, you know, craft, also craft, yeah, yeah, craft. When are we going to get to Uffizi Gallery, Louvre Museum? When? When? <laughs>